I'm just making myself available in case anybody has any questions about the new 100 day gong that I just started today. Um, I don't have anything in particular to discuss. Just wanted to make sure people had an opportunity to um, give any feedback that they wanted. And um, I mentioned before that I'm probably going to be having, you know, I'll, I'll have to be, I'll be doing my farm work a bit with the mushroom farm. Hello. Just, just wondering if anybody has any comments or questions or feedback. <clears throat> so, um, I basically, I plan to just keep going with the three hours more or less. And that works well for me. Hello. <clears throat> Just wondering if anybody has any feedback about the the next 100-day gong that I started today and about how the last one went. <laughs> Good to see you, too. <clears throat> Did you get a chance to join in this morning or... Is the uh, is the uh, three hours too long for you or cool? So um, I have yeah, like every every couple weeks on Monday, I might have to start a little late, like I did this morning. Started a couple minutes late, but it's but that's worked out all right. I haven't really had to start that late so do you have any questions have you have you been able to feel the energy at all do you feel do you feel anything do you see anything <laughs> have you had any um synchronicities you noticed anything from the last hundred days did you did you start up did you do pretty much the whole hundred days any kind of any kind of feedback um, awesome. Yeah, sometimes I've been, I was doing that algae research for the presentation. So I was ended up staying up later doing research. And so sometimes I'm use meditation to kind of like catch up on my sleep. <laughs> I mean, I stay in the full Lotus, but, um, you know, sleep is natural meditation, but obviously, ideally, you do not, you know, meditation is not the same as sleep. In fact, uh, Chun Yulin, he said how his teacher would check on them. When he was doing his cave meditation, he went 28 days with no sleep at all. And he said that otherwise, you know, his Qigong master would check in on, on them when they're in their cave meditating in full lotus to make sure they're not sleeping. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't know. I guess nobody else is out there. You don't, if you don't have any other comments, but, oh, I was inspired by the eye of God. Oh, you mean the, yeah, right. The, yeah, I know. I was, I was looking at, um, Jim Nance's uh, Bible in the middle of the night. Cause I had like the Easter dinner. I had more salt and chocolate than I usually eat. <laughs> and I couldn't tell him like, was the salt keep me awake or the chocolate? Anyway, I, so yeah, I had shown that Bible to my family. Um, and then, it, so I looked at that passage again and then it struck me what he really means by the guiding chi that it's from that passage in the Bible. And he told me he read that. 
he read the Bible for his Qigong training. He read it. He said he could feel the energy from the Bible as he was reading it. He read the whole Bible as part of his uh, Qigong training. So then he gave it to me and he, he, there's some notes, you know, he, that's the section he, he had the bookmark in that, that passage of the Bible. And then he had that section that it showed. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can only assume that that's what the guiding chi is from is that passage in his Bible. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, <laughs> um, as far as in alchemy, obviously you have to use the spirit. The spirit is like your spiritual ego, but that's, so that would be in that Bible passage, they're basically saying that that's what's um, the God's eye is the eye of God is like the, what in India they call it Ishwara, which would be like any of these avatars, whether it's like Krishna or I don't know, Shiva, but they, um, as the spiritual light, then they are, they become one with God, essentially. So they call him a God man. And so in meditation, you have to turn the light around through in meditation to achieve that state where your spiritual vision is then resonating with this um, ether awareness and then, and but it's only Ramana Maharshi is the one who says, well, you, you know, you really can't see God. Like the origin of God is this is pure formless awareness. So what he says is that in Advaita Vedanta, the, the light gets so bright that you lose your own sense of self. There's no longer any kind of ego. And then you just have this pure... Um, information awareness but it's it's a um ether it's also a force you know so it's the, that's the shakti so in in alchemy in Taoist alchemy they they say that the chi is the mother and the spirit is the child and so in that sense the child of god is this um ishwara as what in christianity they you know they call jesus you know from the trinity and but in India it would be like Krishna or um, Shakt or Shiva or whatever. Um, so essentially, and then like the bookmark in his Bible was the chalice uh, prayer, which is about the mother of God. So for example, the guy, the um, Saint Joseph de Copertino who levitated, he worshipped the mother of God, and. Anyway, so like you find that in Taoism where they call it the the mysterious valley and the the emptiness and the you know the mother and so essentially like Ramana Maharshi says, well, people want to see the self as light, but it is it's not light. So there's a bit of a paradox there, and um, Sri Aurobindo. He was, you know, another famous Indian yoga master, and he he talked about this paradox where, and he he actually said it's the same thing that you find in quantum physics, where you know you have that inherent uncertainty, what they call time fre frequency uncertainty in quantum in uh, physics. So there's always this trade-off. Um, and uh, Jim Nance, he actually had he talks about that too, where he says basically like. Um, you have this image, you're focusing on this image and then the, the image will like heal itself. So in other words, the, it's not him that's doing the healing, but it's the energy of God that does the healing. And then the vision of God changes based on the healing that's occurred. And so by him, by him turning the light around, he's able to like resonate with this pure energy information, and then that will cause the eye of God to then transform. You know, to to trans, and that's also what enables these precognitive visions when you're in meditation. Um. 
and then and obviously like there's the case of the the yogi master in um in uh thailand and he's he levitates but as soon as he realizes he levitates he falls back down so he has to learn to maintain samadhi so he can maintain levitation um in other words he has to keep turning the light around as um to and that so they would call that the quantum zeno effect in physics where you're basically you're emptying out the measurement or you're you're not you're causing the wave function to not collapse because you take the measurement so fast so it so it's like a strobe light effect you know it's kind of like how a movie works you know where you, if you have the 22 frames per second or whatever then your brain thinks it's continuous motion so it's the same kind of thing where you have to maintain this intensity of light so that the light is so bright and I haven't I haven't achieved that state myself. I mean, I'm just this is just based on what I read. I might you might have little little flashes of it, you know. And then that's what activates the wan chi. When you when you have the wan chi as the golden light. So you'll feel that strong heat. Have you felt any have you felt much heat from the meditation like in the lower dantian? Do you feel much heat? Anybody else have any other comments or questions? I'm not going to take much time today. I'm just kind of just rambling as usual. Just wanted to make sure if anybody had any feedback. Um, of course, that after I end the stream, then anybody can just post a comment in the comments section. But um, yeah, I mean, we did 100 days and it ended right on Easter. So that's pretty cool. I th that seems pretty auspicious. <laughs> I didn't plan it out that way. Um, but for me, like when there's the full moon and the equinox, I can feel a much stronger um, magnetic bliss in the center of the brain. And then I also feel, I see light. I started to see blue light at night. And when you meditate at night, the, the, third, the third eye the two channels uh, automatically connect between the front and the back of the head. The what they call the upper dantian, the upper elixir field, automatically connects. And then when you meditate from eleven to one in the daytime, that's when the lower dantian two channels automatically connect. So you'll feel a lot more heat, you know, naturally in the lower dantian. Okay, you haven't felt a lot of heat yet. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, for me, okay, great. Yeah, the, the, the standing exercises would be how you activate the heat. Um, and then the meditation would like build on, build on that activation. So, um, Basically, like if you learn the Wim Hof breathing method, which every like that's real famous now on the internet, right? But that's the traditional Tumo breathing, and I discuss that in my um, training manual. But I don't I don't know if people have read my training manual or if they've seen it. Um, I could post a link, but it's my first, my oldest video. My oldest video has the links for that. But essentially, it's based on the nervous system. But so you have that parasympathetic rebound. So when you're doing the standing exercises, you're pushing the sympathetic nervous system to its extreme. And then it causes a parasympathetic rebound as like an opposite extreme as a deep relaxation. And you'll get you'll get that, you know, you'll get that from other kinds of exercises like resistance training. You get that if you do like strong weight lifting but um the court but something like the horse stance is basically like a resistance training because your legs will start shaking pretty fast but of course you're combining that with the meditation and that's what oh right yeah the yawning <laughs> that's exactly it that's your parasympathetic rebound being activated um 
And so when you're just doing that as breathing exercises, um, the diaphragm is the second largest muscle in the body after the, the glutes. Of course, when you're standing in a horse stance, that activates the glute, glute muscles. And so when you just do breathing exercise with the diaphragm, then when you, when you, you do the 30 deep breaths, what in Taoism they call it the quick fire breathing. And then, um, then you hold the breath after exhale, and that activates the vagus nerve. And it turns out that the vagus nerve in the brain has to be activated in order for the adrenaline to create the heat in your lower body. So like the, the quick breathing, where you try to feel your kidneys and you breathe like 30 times deep, deep, fast breathing. And the reason you do it fast is because you want to exhale CO2 at a faster rate than your body naturally creates CO2. So then you have a deficit of um, CO2 in the body. And so that will change your blood pH level. And then when you do hold your breath after the exhale on the, th on the, after the 30th quick on um, breath, then because you you change your blood pH level, then it does your uh, diver's reflex is no longer activated in the center of your brain. And so you can hold your breath for longer after exhale. And when you're holding your breath after exhale, that's what activates the vagus nerve. So then, and also then the, the 30 deep breaths also double your adrenaline levels, but it takes that deep brain um, vagus nerve activation to then actually activate the adrenaline you know so it's sort of a it's a it's a really fascinating um technique and it's considered the foundation of the practice um and if you look at it like if you look at like trans dance training by the original human culture where this is all from the the son bushman what they call tachoma training and that's exactly what they do is they just they keep dancing around um you know doing fast quick breathing cuz they're shuffling their feet and and so eventually they're going to hit this parasympathetic rebound and then they will fall on the ground and while they're doing that dancing they're supposed to visualize fire under under the water in their belly so that's the exact same you know, they're meditating while they're standing. So you, and then when they fall on the ground, eventually as the energy builds up, the, then they start doing astral travel, but they're supposed to be using the energy to um, heal the females, you know, because the females are the ones singing, singing and clapping. And as they're singing and clapping, then they're, the female energy is going into the males. And so by the males dancing, they're taking in the female energy and then transforming it. Essentially, they're, they're changing the frequency of the light. And eventually, then you start to realize that it all, it's all based on frequency of light. And the, the matter in the body is actually from frequency of light. And so that's why in the original human culture, they talk about the ropes, these what they call ropes and also um, um, I think they call them darts where they're, they, the, the energy that they're sending into people, you know, they call that like, I think they call them darts maybe, but, or arrows, maybe they're arrows. And then, but so then they can see the, they can see that the different colors of light, you know, as these astral ropes and they can. And so the, it's the same thing as alchemy where the red light has to be like changed into blue light or whatever based on the the color of the light. Um, and then like I experienced when I did the intensive training, um, I could, I saw ghosts for real. I saw the ghosts that were coming to the Qigong master to get healed. And he confirmed what I saw. I didn't say anything to anybody, but he said, since somebody can see this, I'll explain what it is. And he explained how there were people who had died and they, they were ghosts. You know, they, he didn't use the word ghost, but like deceased 
like dead people or whatever. And they were coming to him to get healed and that he regularly heals ghosts. And um, they, they floated in from outside the room. They were yellow lights shaped like humans. And then I also smelled cancer and he, and I didn't, you know, he said that he said, well, Qigong masters can smell cancer. It smells like rotting flesh. And so um, the, the weird thing is, is that like a couple years later, I read this in a, that um, healing makes our hearts happy, which is a book about the San Bushman original human healing culture. And they have, they have this quote that I stumbled across and it says that, you will see spirits and you will smell, um, you know, sickness like rotting flesh and, and then you'll do healing. And so that's when I realized, wow, I had actually achieved what our original human culture, you know, achieved. Like that's what it means to be truly human in our original human culture. And yet, you know, I only achieved that for one experience and then I fell back out of it because I didn't know, I didn't realize that the, the dancing, the dancing is the foundation of that energy to maintain the purity and the celibacy and all that. And I just thought, well, I'll just sit in full Lotus all the time. So then I overused my third eye energy <laughs> and I had a lot of, I had a lot of wild experiences, you know. But before that happened, I um I still had some strong healing experiences. I was telling, I shared with my family how I had I had accidentally pulled this lady's spirit out of the top of her skull without touching her, and because um Chini teaches you know you never pull energy blockages out of the the top center of the skull, and I had forgotten that because he just mentioned it once, and I didn't think much of it at the time. But in the level two of the Spring Forest Qigong, you learn how to heal other people. And um, you don't touch them at all, but you pull out the energy blockages. And I accidentally put my hand above this lady's head. And she couldn't see what I was doing because she was sitting to the side. But I felt this strong magnetic blob get like a heavy magnetic blob get pulled out of the top center of her skull. And as soon as I pulled that out, she just burst out bawling and then she just kept crying and, and everybody like left, everybody was gone. And then she, I, we went downstairs and then um, I saw my buddy from the university and I said, you're not going to believe what just happened. And we were, and then, and then, Hey, Irma. <laughs> uh, anyway, so then I turned we turned around and she was coming towards us. Yeah, she somebody had their arm around her and she was still crying. And then um so we had both we had walked downstairs and she was still crying. So it had been like, you know, five minutes later. But yeah, I saw her later at an at a later um guild. This these were called guild practice meetings. We would meet once a month to practice healing. And I saw her later and she smiled at me because she realized I had just I had just made an innocent uh, mistake, you know. My, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't trying to, but what it, I had just finished my fast and Jim Nance was there and he, it's, he asked me to share with everybody my experiences from the fast and I shared that. And then she asked me to do a healing on her and that's what happened. <laughs> so it was, that was one experience I had that was before my channels. Cause I stopped meditating when I had an even more intense experience where I experienced this space-time vortex of the room spinning around me, but it wasn't just like dizziness. It was a space-time vortex, and that really freaked me out. And then, and that's when I stopped meditating because I'm like, I got to find out what that was, what it meant. And when I when I had that experience, I also experienced. Um, I came out of meditation, and I said, um, I real I experienced that my mind and my body are not the real me. <laughs> the deeper I go, the more I cry from joy. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The crying, the crying is part of the healing experience because I went through that too. When I first started, um, when I was doing that training, when I was fasting, when I was fasting and meditating, um, I, um, I had, I had some real good cry sessions cause it's like, 
the crying that's your long energy and that's the that's the yang chi that means you're activating your yang chi you're building up your yang chi um so the 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 lungs are they're either sadness or their courage so you're when you clear out the sadness and you're building up your courage you know or in in the five elements they he calls it content contentment so you can have different names for the emotional energy so that's great to hear that you're having that i'm just wondering if anybody else has any other comments or questions you notice increased body okay the five elements yeah the i mean you know, i mean it's basically <laughs> yeah yeah and the joy the joy is the um the heart energy and that's an, that's another that's probably my favorite part of the practice where you once you start opening up the heart and you that's when you start seeing light to internally um and then when you really build up the light then you start seeing it externally as auras and that's when your third eye is starting to open up um in the Taoist yoga alchemy book they call that the difference between the relative void and the absolute void so the relative void is when you just see light with your eyes closed but then when you start seeing light externally with your eyes open as like auras and stuff then that's the absolute void and the absolute void is the void that never goes away it's like the truth of the universe um and that's that gets back to that quote from um jim nats for that i read in the middle of the night from the bible i mean i've been noticing cloud auras like when you look at the clouds you see auras around them. <laughs> um yeah so it's just a matter of how much you practice Oh, cool. Actually, that's a that's a thing where they see stuff in the sky toward the end of the small universe. Ah, nice. Yeah, the the brain bliss is something that um I definitely feel it stronger from the while meditating. And um that just that's just part of the building up the energy. In fact, the, the Taoist yoga alchemy and immortality book, they talk about that where the pressure in your brain will keep building up. And so you might think it's unusual at first, but that's, that's just the, the, that's the Yang Chi building up because the Yang Chi has substance, right? So that's your cerebral spinal fluid. And what's happening is the Yin Chi is in the blood. And so the pineal gland, what it does is it converts the blood into increased uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And so you're essentially you're increasing the yin chi to build up the yang chi, and um, but you're doing that with with the the yin shen and yang shen, and when you so you're combining the two the the two the shen and the chi from the yin and the yang, and they're opposite complementary opposites. And you do that when you're doing that, then you activate the wan chi. And the Wan Chi is this, it's both inside and outside the body. And it's that's what this ether, um, what they call Shakti. But like like when I would meditate more before, because we moved to this new place and it's much harder to meditate here because it's like a smaller place. There's a lot more noise. And, the, you know, when I, the, my last place I lived at, um, I, was, I, had my own, I had my own room that was quiet and stuff. And fairly isolated so i meditated a lot more and um and when the pro the propane heater with the the switch would turn on the electric you know for the heater whatever and when it would when it would kick on the center of my brain would get shocked you know when i was meditating and so that's it's a bit um it's a bit disturbing, like, like how, um, like you have to, when you build up the chi, you have to learn to control the chi. And that's why, that's why it's so important to store it in the lower dantian. So, um, Chen Yi Lin said that, like, when he used to get angry, like earlier in his practice, 
when he would get angry, like if he got angry, light bulbs would explode in his house. And then, and the other, other thing is he said that one time he was mowing the lawn and he was angry and the, the lawnmower just started smoking. <laughs> um, but he said that he had one time he, he, when he was in deep meditation, his heart just stopped. And he said he was walking around like that for two hours without his heart working at all. And so he said he doesn't recommend this, but he said after that experience, he doesn't, if he has any kind of anger or anything, it just, it goes away right away. And that's what they call achieving um, eternal liberation in um, Advaita Vedanta. That's what that's called. But in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, that's called emptying out the seventh level of consciousness, which is a spiritual ego. And um, that's what Jim Nance also achieved. When he went on sabbatical for like three months where he just did constant meditation. And he said, he told me he had this big heart awakening. And I realized that that must have been what he achieved. achieved. And because he gave me that experience once in the car. I, I told that, I've told that story before where I was ranting in anger. And then he said, well, he said, but Drew, I'm on your side. And then I just kept ranting in anger. And then um, I was, you know, about politics. And then um, he was super quiet. And then all of a sudden I felt this really strong electrical shock, like deep on the right side of my heart. And it's like, it came like from inside, like from beyond, from beyond death, you know, of my heart on the right side. And, um, and of course I just immediately shut up when I felt that deep, electrical shock and then as soon as i shut up and i'm driving the car and then i'm sitting there in silence and then he just says he just said i just wanted to see if you were speaking from your heart and and you were and then i'm like okay like <laughs> like that's a good way to get somebody to shut up you know toward the end of the small universe um but that's like your right side vagus nerve. The right side vagus nerve goes to the right side of your heart. And it's a well-proven fact in medicine that you can die from like fright. If you overactivate your right side vagus nerve, it'll literally stop your heart. But what you're doing in meditation, like on the really deep level, you're using your spirit, the biophotons, to then literally like, you know, transcend death as immort what they call immortality, you know. I even said that to Jim once. I said, um, I don't know, something about how he had achieved immortality. And anyway, yeah, so I, I feel that brain bliss pretty much all the time. Most of the time I don't notice it, but it's, it's, that's more or less the dopamine. That's from the dopamine and, um, the dopamine is the vagus nerve being activated in your brain. So, like, if you drink, you know, caffeine, you'll feel it stronger because caffeine increases your dopamine. But, of course, in meditation, the goal is to go beyond dopamine because you want to go to a deeper level of serotonin. Like, if you take, like, a psychedelic, that they'll say, well, you'll see in the quantum consciousness research, they're saying, well, actually, that, that actually increases your consciousness awareness because the, they've realized that the blue light, the terahertz, is what is from the link to the serotonin in the brain. Well, the tryptophans. And so like Stuart Hameroff, he argues that, well, taking psychedelics actually will increase your level of, of consciousness in, 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 as a, a way of saying, you know, as a manner of speaking, it's kind of hard to explain it that way. But, um, but, you know, because what they're saying is that the, in terms of the tubulins in the cells, like in each cell, you have the tubulin and especially in the neurons, they're saying that that's what, that the, there's a special kind of tubulin in the pyramid, pyramidal uh, neurons that humans especially have more pyramidal neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And that those, the, the microtubules with the, the t they have two different kinds of tubulins and it creates a, negative refractive index and so the there's a resonance between those tubulins that then what roger penrose he calls it negative resonance 
And so you literally have a superluminal um, signal that's a phonon. It's a phonon signal from the future. And that's why um, Penrose, Roger Penrose, he has these videos. These, his latest videos on YouTube are about precognition and how the, the foundation of consciousness is actually this awareness, what he calls proto-consciousness, but it's proto-consciousness that's precognitive, you know, from the future. So when so when you resonate with that, that's what you know. That would be the Wan Chi energy, and then you'll see more blue light. And and but you know, if you take psychedelics, you can. That's through the serotonin, right? So you need to have that deep vagus nerve. Like when I took a really strong dose of um plant based, uh, DMT, the from the plant root, uh, Mimosa hostilis. I was sitting in full lotus, and I think I'd fasted for the day to prepare for it. I did it on my own. And I got this super strong kundalini, like it was this amazingly strong um, orgasmic bliss uh, that shot up my spine. And it also felt like my vertebra, my um, sacrum was being split open like a, like, you know, when you, if you eat, ever eat shrimp and you peel off the, the shell, that's what it felt like where my, the vertebra just like peeled back and opened up and then the bliss shot up my spine and when it went in went to the third eye it felt like i heard a gunshot in my head but i think it was um i think uh, probably like maybe just my head knocked against the wall or something but but after that i could just see light like super strong light you know the like a rainbow aura and i was kept sitting in full lotus and it was so strong that i couldn't have any left brain thinking really um like like if i wanted to take my glasses if i wanted to put my glasses on i could have the thought you know i could have the thought i'll i'll move my glasses but by the time i tried to actually have the movement with my body then my brain would empty out the thought and it my the motor function wouldn't kick in you know and so i had to just sit and ride through it right and then and then I, and then um I could see the uh, I realized that um my external perceptions were actually all after my um internal internal awareness based on the light this like rainbow vortex inside the body and so everything we experience internally is actually like a, a projection of this or, or externally is you know, after our internal awareness, which is from the future. And so then it sort of like balances out and you have this um, illusion of linear time in the, in the present, you know, as an external linear time, which is what science normally assumes. There's a great quote from my previous blog I have where they say, that even if the accelerating universe was were to change direction, we would not be able to observe it because all of life is based on biological entropy. But that's actually not true. That's because if you you know because the quantum this quantum proto consciousness is from what they call negative entropy. Um, it's just assumed that we can't directly access the negative entropy. But but. Roger Penrose is saying, yeah, we can. We can through meditation or like these extreme sports where you go into the zone or playing music and stuff and and or doing psychedelics and toward the end of the small universe. Yeah. So so anyway, with the brain bliss, uh Jim Nance, he just calls that my um brain blockage because it's basically it just means like you're still stuck in the dopamine, but when you open up the serotonin, you start seeing more light. And then the when you get the joy of the heart, well, that's the oxytocin being activated. So essentially, with your your neurohormones will turn into neurotransmitters. They'll they'll increase your neurotransmitter levels. There's a direct connection between the the neurohormones and neurotransmitters. So, for example, they'll say that the lower body serotonin is not directly, it can't get past the blood brain barrier um, in contrast to the, the uh, brain serotonin. But 
when you have the serotonin in the cerebral spinal fluid or in the blood, then it's gonna get it's gonna get through there th through the pineal gland, the pineal gland, because that uh, the blood will go directly to the pineal gland. And um and so then so as you the dopamine as that the bliss builds up, then it it builds up into serotonin. And as Master Nan watch in, he says, well, if you're sitting in full lotus, you want to stay in full lotus because the pain gets really bad. But then you have this parasympathetic rebound, and that's the vagus nerve female orgasm because the right side vagus nerve, for females, it goes to the cervix. And for males, it goes to the testes. So what they talk about in this yoga training is that for the males, they're the external – reproductive organ it retracts and eventually at the extreme level it gets pulled back into the body and that's why in the standing martial arts like praying mantras they have i have a video in one of the there was some bbc show where they go there i think they're in hong kong or something and there's this praying mantis master and he's like yeah you know you can he's had him kick him in the groin over and over and over but then he's like okay is it okay if you stick your hand up there? And the guy's like, uh, all right, you know, and the, he could feel nothing. He's like, oh my God, there's nothing there. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, yeah, that's, you know. <laughs> um. Anyway, so this is like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan knows nothing about this. Like he just says, oh, the, the uh, five, the five animals are a joke and this, it's all fake. And it's like, yeah, well, the thing is, when you're dealing with emotional energy, then you're not gonna you're not gonna waste that on like competitive fighting. You're just gonna eventually that gets you into meditation, and so you end you end up having this hierarchy of um, training where, like the Qigong master at Shaolin, you know they're they'll do they'll do protective fighting, but the it's like like Jim Nance, he told me that Chun Yi Lin used to um he used to explode rocks. He would break up rocks with the chi energy at a distance. And there's some videos of that I, I saw, like um uh Jiang, Qigong Master Jiang, he's the guy who did pyrokinesis. And I had somebody come to my house who had gone and seen Jiang. I I meant to say I was looking when I was I was looking at clouds and I noticed the large trees of Oris. Ah, cool. Yeah, that's I totally can dig that because I had dreams about trees, about the auras around trees, the oak trees in the yard that I grew up in. When I had been meditating a lot more in the city when I was living on my own, and I was living not that far from the house I grew up in. And so first I had this tree of uh, this dream of the a rainbow aura. And this is probably when I was, I had been experimenting, you know, testing out the Qigong with some, um, I also did a uh, sal salvia divinorum. But anyway, um, yeah, so, and then I had the, a dream of one of the oak trees had a rainbow aura around it. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting because it was the yard I grew up in. And then the, like soon after that, I had another dream of a, a different oak tree in the same yard and it had a big um, white bear leaning up against the tree. And I was like, well, that's really weird. And so I went back to the yard and that tree with the white bear against it had just been cut down. Cause I, you know, cause I went, I would go by that yard pretty often, you know, cause it wasn't that wasn't, was pretty close to my, where I was living and it's where I grew up. So I'd go check on it. So then I realized that these trees must have, um, been watching over me when I was a child because I was always playing in the yard and that they like normally, you know, you think of Buddhism, you think there's sentience, sentience intelligence. And so you think a tree wouldn't have sentience intelligence and yet it still has some kind of, um, it has some kind of healing, healing energy to it. And so like a uh, Qigong master, Chen Yi Lin, he said that, when he healed a tree once by reading the tree's aura and then he could see where the energy blockages were in the tree. And, you know, that's how he healed it. And 
So, but you get the idea that, um, like Einstein, he said the most important question is, is the universe friendly? And and then Louis de Broglie, yeah, I know. Louis de Broglie said, well, you know, he called it the law of phase harmony. So in other words, there, there is some kind of inherent um, harmony to the universe of, that has to do with being alive. And so then you have to think, like in terms of Jim Nance's um, Bible quote, for his guiding chi, it's like, well, that would be the mind of God means that the whole universe is alive and that it's based on this harmony. And, and Chen Yi Lin has even said that he's like, there is a harm, there's a harmony to the to the universe, even you know, even though you see these like galaxies destroying each other and whatever black holes colliding and stuff like that, but there's some, there's a deeper harmony to it. And, and that would be this um, quantum, this pure uh, time and frequency. So you, you can't see the time and frequency, but Roger Penrose talks about how that's what exists before the big bang. And after the acceleration of the universe, he says that there's no space, but there's this time frequency that's it's non-local um, so there's no sense of scale as space, and yet it's also proto consciousness. So, and and Roger Penrose, he's not, you know, he's not religious, but he's just come to this conclusion by studying science. So it's pretty wild. Um, and so the idea is like, well, if the whole universe is actually alive, then life, like you know, Schrodinger, he realized that too. It's like well, the same negative entropy that powers the sun. Is the same negative entropy that creates life on Earth, um, and so you know that that would be what powers um, ghosts when when we leave our body. Like if you think, well, if ghosts need to be healed, then the the emotional blockages would be based on um, this time and frequency that is essentially what they call the magnetic moment of a virtual photon. You know, so like in classical physics, the virtual photon, it's not supposed to actually exist. It's supposed to just be a, a mathematical trick of what they call renormalization. But the physics professor that I've been corresponding with, he says that renormalization is wrong. And that, and it's, be, and he's the guy who collaborated with David Bohm in quantum physics. So there's this fascinating, um, disagreement about the foundation of reality, you know, because they're always trying to figure out, well, how does relativity jive, jive with uh, quantum physics? And um, and so Basil J. Harley, you know, the guy I've been corresponding with, he says that's all due to non-commutativity. And that's what I figured out on my own. You know, that's why I, I that's why I first contacted ba Basil J. Harley, like about 10 years ago now. What? No, I think it was actually more like eight years ago, six years ago. It was like six years ago. Anyway, so yeah, um, and then that gets you into the whole ecological crisis. And it's, you know, because like our, our science, science, we've been great for making all these, all these, all this technology, but um, it's, it, it's increased gravitational entropy on earth which is a really weird thing to think about because um, you have to think of it in terms of the, the photon energy, the frequency of the photon energy and how that's, how that relates to gravitational entropy. And yeah, so it's, you know, Roger, Roger Penrose, he's mentioned this. And then Basil J. Hiley, he told me, well, he hasn't, Basil J. Hiley hasn't, he hasn't talked about gravitational entropy at all, <laughs> but he, you know, he and Rod, he and Roger Penrose, they've, they're buddies, you know, they've collaborated together and stuff. And so anyway, that's pretty much like the closest I can get to Western science on, on it. And, um, and, uh, I don't know. Does anybody else have any other feedback or experiences they've been having? Um, yeah, the, like this whole idea of what is 
what is sentient um, life like? Because even like even with this quantum consciousness, they're basically they're defining human human consciousness based on the pyramidal neurons because they're saying like that's what make us makes humans different than chimpanzees because we have these spindle spindle neurons. It turns out that whales have more spindle neurons than humans. And that so then they're saying, well, whales, they have to be very, very uh, intelligent and they're social. And, you know, of course, we killed like over three million of them. And so, you know, it's like, what is that? You know, that doesn't <laughs> doesn't bode well for. <laughs> but um, but so in Qigong, they're basically saying that um, like they're more focused on the tubulin, the collagen. Uh, if you read like Qigong master Yan Shin, and he did a lot of science research on Qigong, and he's he basically said it's the due to the collagen because that's the most common protein in the body, and the collagen's aligned like ninety percent. It's aligned vertically in the body, so that's why when you do these standing exercises, the collagen's piezoelectric. Well, yeah, the God, the idea of God being light is, it's, it's really like a matter of perspective. Like you could say, you could say God is light, where, whereas the, the cosmic mother is, you know, this pure emptiness, this emptiness, information, like information, energy or whatever. Um, like, like there's a book called um, When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone. It's a great book when God is a woman because essentially, um, like the 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 etymology of the word God is it's Indo-European word and it's so it's the root word actually means bull b u l l so like in India Brahman Brahman means God but Brahman also means bull and so it I mean it's ironic because if if you you can trace it all the way back to our original human culture because the oldest spiritual training is the what they call the um Elon bull dance the Elon bull dance and it takes place at the female first menstruation so when the when the when a female first menstruates she's considered to have the strongest um spiritual energy the strongest numb numb energy <laughs> well see this is why like my my name my name on on the internet is void is yin yang because essentially i think this this claim that 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 there's some like neutrality you know i don't i don't agree with that i think that it's male and female as an eternal motion so um, like the West, the West, they try to, they define time in Western science. Time is reduced to a symmetrical spatial measurement. And so they, so like when you turn the light around in meditation, then you can, you can say that, that that's, that's God in the sense of it, it never changes. But what, what really never changes is this process of the energy that the light um, resonates with. And so you, so that's what the, you have this eternal yin yang flowing. And so that's what Buddhism talks about is, is that there's this eternal motion that they call it. Um, what's the word for it? The, um, it, well, okay. I'm having a blank because the Buddhism is like a whole different thing, but um yeah, so essentially, uh, you know, I just call it complementary opposites. But um, yeah, so you know, like Western Western science. See, that's the thing is Western science is based on dualism, but in the non-Western philosophy, you always have it's like they'll just call it neither neither this nor not this. You know, so it's like basically like you can't put it into words. But at the same time, it is a it is a process of complementary opposites. So that's why when we do the standing exercises, we'll put the the yin the yin hand with the yang part of the body and the yang hand with the yin part of the body, 
And, you know, yeah, the neti neti, the Buddhism was actually a heterodox um, aspect of Hinduism. And that's because Brahmanism is actually a Western philosophy. It came from the, the, you know, it's still very controversial to say this in India, but the, it's proven now by DNA science that the Vedic philosophy and the Brahmins, they came into India uh, on chariots and wagons around like 1800 BCE from West Asia. And, and they brought with them wheat, you know, the, you know, the wheat farming, wheat farming first went in India, like 6,000 BCE. But essentially, um, you have the same thing in Africa where the pastoralists, it's been proven now by DNA science that the pastoralists went into Africa, into like Nigeria and Senegal and stuff. Yeah, the see, right, right. Because the Kung Fu, it's also Gong Fu. So it's Qigong, because Gong just means work. And so, um, like, if you if you study uh, Qigong Master Yan Chin, he's saying that you know you can you can do Qigong without doing martial arts, but you really should not do martial arts without doing Qigong. You know, and yet that's how martial arts is taught now. Is it's taught without the Qigong foundation to it, whereas the traditional teaching was that the Qigong is first, and that the martial arts is comes out of the the Qigong. And so, um, yeah, that's why it's, it has to be like a secret lineage. The Qigong used to be like a secret lineage because it's very difficult to control the Qi. And also that's why it's alchemy because it relies on um, purification of the mind. So the celibacy starts in the mind. So you can't have any lust, like lust, like basically if you have your eyes open and you see beautiful form, then it's going to trigger a lust reaction. And so like with the Brahmin priests, if they actually made eye contact with a female, they'd have to spend vacation rituals. So obviously that's why they have the caste system because the Brahmin priests would be, you know, isolated for purification and then they're protected by the warrior caste and all this. And so somebody like Ramana Maharshi, he achieved eternal liberation liberation but then basically his body just was left to rot away and get sick and then other people had to take care of him but whereas in Tao, you try to combine all those aspects into one thing so and also in mahayana buddhism you know which is essentially it's like Taoism, you know where it's it's like chan chan buddhism is essentially it's just a combination of Taoism and buddhism in china so but even that, even that training is relies on the qigong meditation being like the highest level of the martial arts. And so the the qigong masters traditionally they were there was a lineage where they were picked out as children. Like there's a really great book called um, "Opening the Dragon Gate" uh, by Wang Wang Li, about Wang Li Ping opening the Dragon Gate, and so he was um, chosen. He was chosen by a Taoist lineage when he was like nine years old. They came and basically took him away and then trained him in full lotus meditation. So he had to learn to sit for two hours nonstop in full lotus where you can't move at all, you know. And that at first the pain is just, you know, excruciating because you cannot move at all. And, um, but then once you break through it, like, um, Master Nan Hua Chin, he said that he went one week in full lotus meditation and the pain just got worse and worse and worse until finally he heard this loud crack. <laughs> and then after that, the bliss just took over and his channels had opened up his leg channels and stuff. And, um, you know, gymnast, he just told me, well, your hips have to drop. And for gymnast to say that, because he, gymnast, he couldn't even get into full lotus at all when he first started out and the only way he could get into full lotus was he had to like um he had to like tear his ligaments his knee ligaments by accident he had these strange bizarre synchronicity 
uh, synchro syn synchronous accidents where one was he was playing basketball and another one was he was on an escalator or something. And he was each time he would be in severe pain and we call up Chun Yi Lin and Chun Yi would say, sit in full lotus, like right away. And then he discovered that even though he had just had this accident that damaged his his knees, he was able to sit in full lotus better because of it and and then heal heal the pain. And that's how he was able to sit in full lotus was by having those strange accidents, which is really weird. And then and then he, you know, it the, his training just kept developing from there. And um, so, yeah, like sitting in full lotus. Has anybody tried sitting in full lotus? Have anybody else, does anybody else do that? Um, the Padma, Padma Asana, what's also called Padma Asana. Whoa, sweet. That's it. That's cool. So does he do full lotus meditation? Wow, that's impressive. You got a mixed martial arts master. Son. Oh wow. Awesome. So so with our um that's really cool. <laughs> I'm being put in my place here. I appreciate it. Well, that's why I'm glad I'm getting feedback here so I can get an idea of where people are at and stuff. Um, Because the thing is, is when we practice in a group, then we get a group energy. You know? And when you get a group energy, that just, it adds, you know, you get a synergy that resonates. And so you get a stronger energy as a group. So there's like Chen Yilin, he always um, advocates practicing in a group. And he, he wanted to have practice group. He has Spring Forest Qigong practice groups. We could... Um, I don't know. I don't even know if they register practice groups anymore. I ha oh, thanks, Irma. I I um like one time I called up the Qigong Center, the Spring Force Qigong Center, and I said, "Is there a practice group nearby me?" And um and they told me of somebody somebody's mom who her daughter was practicing Qigong, and I felt a little bit strange about that because I was like. I don't know, twice her age, at least twice her age, and it would have just been us two practicing together. And well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I um, actually that 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 woman, she has a um YouTube channel, and so she knows I practice Qigong. She lives not that far away from me, but um, so I decided well, it'd be easier just to do it online. And if she wants to join in, I told her about it. I think, you know, I said, if she wants to practice online with everybody else, then, you know, but um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked up to see if there's any physical practice groups in person. Um, actually, uh, Chun Yi, he says it's easier to heal people at a distance. And Jim says the same thing. And essentially, when you're in person, it's too easy for your ego to get um, to pick up the superficial blockages and then to have your mind get blocked by, you know, more superficial things like, I don't know, it could be just personality stuff or whatever. You know, we're humans, right? So <laughs> we're like, like, I'm, I'm sort of like a hippie slob type and maybe somebody else is like like i remember chenny saying he was a bit turned off by like i i came in once with like a really shaggy beard you know because it's winter time in minnesota i was riding my bicycle outside all the time you know i'm <laughs> but of course he doesn't i don't think he even has much facial hair or something i don't know <laughs> so it took him he's like he had to realize that how that people were coming in from their their meditation caves <laughs> You know, like hermits. Um, okay, well, seems like I've I've uh, I've rambled more than I should have. Um, so people are cool with the starting up the new gong. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to apologize for being a little late or whatever. Because uh, some sometimes every other Monday, sometimes I might be a little late because we have stuff going on at the house. But um, yeah, and, I'm, and then I'm going to have to do farming work on occasion. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Juliana. Okay. Yeah, we'll have, yep, take some breaks. And, but uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for um, participating. It's a big time commitment, but the thing is, the more you meditate, then the less sleep you need. And so then you start to, you start to tap into this nonlinear time where you realize, you know, you can start having like precognitive um, visions or just like synchronicities and stuff happening in your life that like solves your problems. You know, kind of like when you wake up from sleeping and all of a sudden you've, you've solved some something you were trying to figure out and it you sleep on it and you, you start having that that on a deeper level stuff happening. And um, and yeah, so. Like it's sort of ironic. It's like, yeah, you it it takes like it's a big commitment to meditate that long, but at the same time, um, it's you can start, you know, if you need less sleep, then you know, and then, I mean, ideally, if you if you can start going into bigu where you're you're doing free energy and you and you need to eat less, you know, and then Chinese like, well, that's less time in the bathroom. <laughs> I don't know, you know. But I, you know, I don't like what we're doing now. It's not that, it's not that intense because it's, but it's, as I appreciate having that extra hour of sitting meditation. So, um, anyway, uh, all right, I'm gonna end the stream. Any other, nothing else. Um. Yeah, I'll have to study. I still need to study the alchemy books more, but that's sort of like a lifelong project. And uh, Chen Yi says that I, th I think too much. And so, you know, really, all ideally, I would be meditating like 12 hours a day. So that would be kind of interesting just to do like a nonstop meditation. I think, oh, yeah, live stream, it shuts off at after 12 hours, I think. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, anyway, all righty. Um, but basically I haven't been building up my energy cause I use it for healing my healing, my mom. Cause that's my main focus is making sure, you know, helping out, helping her out. Um, one time she said the other time she's, I said to her, Oh, you're, you're tired because one of my cheat. My chi goes out of my eyes into into my mom when she's tired, and she finally she said, "Well, how do you know I'm tired?" And I told her that I said, "Well, my chi's going into you." <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you tomorrow.